10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning Live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Great to have you join us. First off, let's uh, take a look at what's happening in the markets, starting with oil. Oil prices uh, rose today, extending gains from the previous session, buoyed by lower crude inventories and higher gasoline demand in the United States. Brent crude futures uh, for September rose 40 cents to $107.02 a barrel, gaining about $2.22 on Wednesday. U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude, that was at $97.78 a barrel, up $0.52. Cents. It also gained about $2.28 in the previous session. U.S. crude oil uh, stockpiles fell by 4.5 million barrels last week, while U.S. gasoline demand rebounded by 8.5% week on week. According to data from the Energy Information Administration, exports also climbed to a record high as WTI traded at a steep discount to Brent, making purchases of U.S. crude grades more attractive to foreign buyers. And the U.S. Federal Reserve has raised its key interest rate by 75 basis points in efforts to cool the country's inflation, which has been most intense since the 1980s. The fourth rate hike announced by the Fed in five months, the federal funds rate, which in indirectly determines the cost of loans, has increased from uh, near zero to a range of 2.25 to 2.5 percent. According to the FOMC, U.S. inflation remains elevated, reflecting supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic, higher food and energy prices, and broader price pressures. Meanwhile, Fed Chair uh, Jerome Powell hints that another unusually large hike may be appropriate in September if price pressures have not sufficiently abated. And back here, the Senate has resolved to summon the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefile, to explain to lawmakers the reasons for the rapid depreciation of the value of the Naira. It also mandated uh, the Committee on Banking, Insurance and other financial institutions to assess the impact of CBN intervention funds meant to support critical sectors of the economy. The upper chamber has taken these resolutions. The federal legislators considered a motion on the state of CBN intervention funds and the free fall of the Naira. The sponsor of the motion, Senator Olubemi Aditubi, bemoans Nigeria's economic challenges and calls for extraordinary measures to address them. Do take a listen. The Senate is further concerned that, as at yesterday, the exchange rate in the autonomous segment PDC of the foreign exchange market was 670 Naira to the United States dollar. And we are told that this, this afternoon, the figure has gone up to 716 Naira to a dollar. The Senate further notes that the CBN should take new measures to curb foreign scarcity and address the sliding rate of Naira exchange. Accordingly, the Senate resolves, one, to call on the Central Bank of Nigeria to urgently intervene to stop the rapid decline in the value of the Naira vis-a-vis -vis the dollar and other international currencies. Two, that the Senate Committee on Banking, Insurance, and other financial institutions should conduct an assessment of the central bank intervention funds and the declining value of the Naira to come up with sustainable solutions. And we see many emerging uh, country currencies there suffering at this point. But to our first uh, conversation, the International Monetary Fund uh, recently caught its global economic growth forecast for 2022 to 3.2% in its report titled Gloomy and More Uncertain as the Ukraine-Russia conflict continues to disrupt the global uh, supply chain. Let's talk to Benedict Egutriku now, Senior Research Analyst at uh, AfriInvest. Uh, join us via Zoom. Great to have you. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I bet the, the IMF revised its economic growth forecast. We're seeing uh, 2022, 2023. Uh, they're at 3.2 percent and 2.9 percent. The downgrade is about uh, four basis points and seven uh, basis points. What is your take, and what are the possible, you know, other drivers? We know it's the war in Ukraine. What else is driving this? Okay, so basically, the downgrade indeed indicates um, some of the materialization of some of the downside risks we highlighted in our half-year report, titled "Deeper and Rabbit Hole." 
And in the report, we highlighted that um, higher than expected inflation, particularly in the United States and major European economies have triggered tightening the global financial condition. And despite the slowing activity we've seen so far, global inflation was revised upwards by the IMF due to rising food and oil prices. Now inflation is expected to hit around 6.6% in the advanced economies and 9.5% in the emerging market and developing economies. This is an upward division of about um, 0.9 percentage points and 0.8 percentage points respectively. Also, some other risks included China, the slowdown which has worsened because of the COVID-19 outbreak and lockdowns. And then finally, like you already mentioned, the negative spillovers from Russia-Ukraine crisis. Apparently, we've seen much more negative spillover coming from that area. All of this has kind of further dented the outlook. When we look at the global economy at large, we found out that the downgrade actually reflects a great moderation in three of the largest economies, the US, China, and the Euro area. In the United States, we've seen that um, the reduced household purchasing power and the higher monetary policy would drive growth further down to 2.3% in 2022. And then in 2023, the IMF expects that it could fall all the way down to 1%. While in China, if further lockdown measures, measures and then the deepening real estate crisis continue to happen, it's going to further push China's growth forecast down to 3.3% from their previous forecast of 4.4% as of April. And then finally, in the euro area, what we've seen so far is that growth has been revised downward to 2.6%, which is just a 0.2 percentage point downgrade. And this just reflects the spillover effect of the Russian Ukraine crisis, given that they are within the same area and then the tighter monetary policy being implemented. And we see the Eurozone there struggling with, you know, uh, gas uh, issues at this point. But, you know, with this uh, pessimistic outlook uh, by the IMF, do you think a recession, you know, is most likely now? Because we, we heard the, uh, the U.S. Fed, uh, Jerome Powell, they're saying that there's no recession, you know, in the U.S. Well, at the moment, the current outlook that the IMF sets is not really cast in stone, as we believe that, Moving forward into the year, there could be a further downgrade. And this is just because of some of the um, headwinds factors I've already mentioned. But in a situation where some of these you know, headwinds actually do crystallize, the IMF has uh, predicted or forecasted that um, the global growth could fall to 2.6% and 2% in 2020, between 2022 and 2023, respectively, with the U US and EU. Euro area experiencing near growth in 2023. But nonetheless, in as much as we are not really expecting a recession this year or possibly next year, we still believe that um, fiscal and monetary authorities have a role to play in order to ensure that a recession is not likely. On the monetary side, what we are seeing is that inflation is already rising and it kind of presents a clear risk for current and future macroeconomic stability. And it's going to be a top priority for policymakers. And if they don't start increasing the interest rate as they are currently doing, we believe that further stock would actually hype inflation rate further. Then definitely we know that a synchronized monetary tightening across countries will definitely lead to a slowdown in global growth in the near term, but delaying it, like I mentioned, will actually just cause things to be worse. But on the fiscal side, we expect that some fiscal support would be necessary in order to kind of help cushion the impact on some of the most vulnerable areas of the economy. And then, you know, given that risks are rising in um, the advanced economies, we think that the emerging markets will actually be suffering, given that rates are higher and could cause some capital outflow. So we expect the emerging markets to kind of tilt towards their exchange rate and see how they can be flexible in order to absorb external shocks. So basically, everybody has a key role to play to ensure that recession doesn't happen this year or in the next year. But nonetheless, we do not see any recession happening in the near term. And the, the IMF, you know, revised the 2022-2023 uh, growth forecast for uh, EMDs to about 3.6 and 3.9%. However, the sub-Saharan Africa region forecast was maintained. Uh, what's driving the growth, you know, in this region? Okay, so if we take a look at the numbers as of April, World Economic Outlook, and they release new numbers, we find out that Nigeria's forecast was retained at 3.4%. However, South Africa received an upgrade of 0.4 percentage point to 2.3 percent. And we believe that the growth in South Africa is mainly driven by the non-oil sector, 
coming from mining, agriculture, manufacturing, finance, and personal services. But if you take a look at the entire region as a whole, one of the major drivers of that growth is given that that area is a oil producing nation or oil producing region. So they are, they are expected kind of, you know, with the benefit of the increasing oil prices. Right. And uh, there seems to be a divergence between, you know, IMF's forecast and, you know, that of AfriInvest. What's uh, driving AfriInvest's conservative forecast of about 2.9%? Okay. So if we take a look at IMF's forecast for Nigeria, that is just hinged on the country taking advantage of the rising rents to oil prices. But we believe here that the existing domestic and external headwinds have indeed, you know, led us to believe that. We don't think a 3.4% is likely, rather a 2.9%. And our conservatism is hinged on the extended negative spillover effect of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war on commodity prices. The weak crude oil production, which we expect that is going to benchmark around 1.6 million barrels or even lower this year, and then the percent offshore capital flight, the rising political risks ahead of the 2023 general and the protracted insecurity and structural challenges. Now, for the oil sector, we are just, you know, we are kind of cautious in our outlook, given that oil production is actually quite low. And what we've seen so far in the GDP numbers that have come out, the oil sector has contracted for, I believe, eight consecutive periods. But we think that the non-oil sector will be the saving grace as we expect it to retain its resilient performance for the rest of 2022. For the agri sector, we expect an average of about 2.5% year on year. And this is supposed to be supported by the sustained intervention facility and improved domestic and external demand. Then on the services and industry part, we expect an increase in digitalization and the gains from export promotion initiatives as well. But in the Many quarter of 2022, we just expect that the lingering pressure of the exchange rate due to FS in liquidity and higher input costs will actually pose as downside risk factors. And, you know, what we've been seeing, you know, FX shortages with uh, most African countries at this point, and, you know, the dollar is still uh, uh, strengthening. Do you see, you know, the, the dollar tapering, you know, anytime soon? At the moment, no, we do not see the dollar tapering anytime soon, especially right now that... Um, the U.S. is trying all its possible best to keep it there because it has indeed reduced import prices for the United States, which is something that they are really benefiting from. So within the near term, we don't see it tapering, given that there's a whole lot of um, FX restriction, mostly from monetary authorities within the emerging markets. And what do you think are the options, you know, for most of these countries now, uh, you know, struggling with dollar shortage? At this moment, using Nigeria as a case study, right now people are trying to just you know utilize the parallel market, which has resulted in the naira to dollar rate spiking as high as 700 naira, and it's expected that uh, towards the end of the year it could go as high as 850 naira, if not worse than that. So right now people are left with no other option than to source effects on parallel market or any other avenue that could help them drive or, you know, fulfill their demand. But in the long run, or in the short, short term, rather, we expect to see increased cost measures because the exchange rate at the moment is ridiculously high. And in uh, the just concluded meeting, the U.S. Fed, you know, raised uh, rates as expected on five basis points. But some were actually expecting, you know, 100 basis points to, you know, rein in uh, the, the rising inflation. But uh, do you think uh, it will impact the, the target of about two point? Uh, zero percent uh, inflation rate. Now we believe that um, the choice by the U.S. Fed to raise interest rate by seventy-five basis points, although the second time straight month, second second consecutive time in its in a period, in a bit kind of down information um, inflation because of the rising inflation number of about forty year high of nine point one percent, we believe is the right move. Although at the moment it is very difficult to judge as to whether it would be enough to bring down inflation target to 2% or if more rates would hike would be needed moving forward. Nonetheless, what we've seen so far is that there have been signs that inflation may very well decelerate in the second half of 2022. Thus far in the US, we've seen that oil prices have fallen, WTI prices have fallen since mid-June, pulling the price of gas and other commodity costs lower. While on the supply side, the supply chain bottleneck that trigger product shortage are beginning to 
is lately some of the products that I even have interest in are seeing some price moderation as well. While on the dollar side, dollar, like I mentioned earlier, has strengthened and this has caused the price of imported goods. And retailers are beginning to have more business to give out discount, given that they have much inventories. So although we think that some of these positive signals will, you know, lead or give the impression that there is going to be a slowdown in inflation, we think that in the short run the economic growth will be, you know, hampered or dampened as borrowing costs is affected, given that it's going to rise and it will kind of bring down demand of the economy. And listen to uh, Jerome Powell's, you know, uh, comments uh, yesterday. Did you get any indications of, you know, what might happen, you know, in the next meeting? Okay, so at the moment, he hinted that um, the interest rate at the moment is at the range of 2.25% and 2.5%, which is close to the Fed 2.5% neutral rate, which means that the rate it can neither stimulate nor prevent economic growth. So at this moment, the Fed is just using the rate as a way of judging to see if it's going to ring in on inflation between now and September when they'll be having their next meeting. And depending on the data that they receive, they could possibly slow down the interest rate hike, not stop it, but slow down in the sense that by cutting it by maybe 50 basis points or going back to the quarterly basis point hike. And looking at the markets yesterday, we saw you know, a lot of action you know, in the U.S. markets from the NASDAQ, the S&P, and we also saw you know, the crypto market actually react. We saw Bitcoin jump about 7%. You know, and the uh, Nasdaq was up uh, almost about 4%, you know, uh, yesterday. Why were investors so excited? It was a rate hike. Yeah. Well, we believe that um, the optimism was based on what, not basically the rate hike itself, but what the Fed mentioned moving forward, where they think that moving forward, interest rate hike may not be as much as they expected because People were thinking that moving forward, they could see possibly more 75 base point increase. But given that they hinted that, depending on what data suggests between now and September, they could cut down um, interest rate to about 25 base point. That kind of you know gave market momentum to. That's why we saw a broad base increase. And do you think this uh, momentum now would be sustained? Because you know everybody is talking about you know, where, the, where, where they can find the bottom for most of these markets. Do you think maybe the bottom is close or we're there yet and this momentum will actually continue or we might see or dumps again across markets maybe next week? Okay, at the moment, it is difficult to decide, but based on historical trend, we could see that um, for a little while, we think the momentum may be kept, but it could further, you know, we could see a pullback as people actually do take profit and try to preserve bond and look for alternative where they could not lose their money, especially when it comes to the bonds market or the treasury yield market in the U.S. market. Yeah, because I remember the last uh, two hikes, you know, the markets actually reacted the same way. You know, we saw, you know, most of them uh, going up. Then the next day or, or, or a few days later, everything, you know, came crashing down and, I don't know. We, we might. I don't know if we'll see that, you know, happen again, you know, with this uh, uh, new one. But I want to thank you so much, uh, Benedict Gutrico, Senior Research Analyst, uh, Afri Invest. It was great having your perspective. Thank you very much. All right. Now, after the break, commodities market update is next. All right, for commodities market update, now we see uh, oil prices uh, elevated uh, this morning. Let's talk to Mai Waige, analyst, financial derivatives uh, company. Join us right here in the studio. Uh, Mai Waige, great to have you. And um, yeah, the, the, it's up again. And exactly after, you know, the uh, Fed decision, you know, yesterday, I was expecting maybe the oil market would actually, you know, pull back. But we're seeing elevated prices this morning. What are you seeing? Well, it's basically to the two primary factors responsible for this. Um, first of all, we had we we had the report that U.S. Invent crude inventories declined about four million barrels, and then and then also there's also higher demand for gasoline in the U.S. And these major things have pushed up the prices of oil. Already, we've seen heat waves in the northeast of the U.S. and the U.K., and so that's driving demand as people um, have higher demand for electricity, air conditioning. That's also driving demand. And like you you mentioned, yes, we were 
expecting that after the rates. But then the Fed mentioned that um, that they will be watching market conditions. But they mentioned that there's a possibility there was a, a, a possibility of slowing the rate of interest, the interest rate hike, the rate of um, the interest rate hike, the rate of increase. And so that actually um, led to the U.S. dollar. The, um, the weakening a bit in, uh, initially it, it uh, increased the strength increased its strength but then it weakened a bit and then we know that when you have a u.s uh, weaker u.s dollar you have um people people are able to buy more commodities because most commodities are denominated the u.s de, um, dollar denominated and so we saw this affect or support increase in all prices yes because it almost made it seem you know it was quite a dovish uh, sentiment we got, you know, from the Fed. Yes, it would, the way, you know, markets were so, you know, excited. Oh, well, a lot of markets already priced this in. Before then, a lot of people anticipated a 75 um, basis point increase. Most people, so that was already priced into the market. And so even as we saw the markets um, do well, yes, we saw the stock markets, crypto markets increase yesterday. We saw the interest rate increase. That also supported all prices all price increase that we saw yesterday. Because now it just seems like, you know what, when maybe uh, the next uh, Fed meeting is coming, maybe I just buy some of these stocks before the Fed meeting and maybe sell once they give the retirement. I, I, I don't think so. I think you <laughs> need knows? to watch market conditions because even the Fed, this time they didn't give um, a clue as to the direction per se that they will be going, right? But they mentioned that they will be looking at market conditions, right? They mentioned that the labor market is still strong, which is a good sign. But then we have GDP numbers coming out today, right? And so that would also give an idea of what is happening in the economy. And so people would be able to forecast or see where the Fed might actually forecast where the Fed might actually go in September. And obviously markets are going to react to all of that. Yeah. Okay, but I hope like, uh, it's meeting the th in the 3rd of uh, August uh, 2022. What are you expecting? Well, um, well, that, that is, um, we'll look at what's happening in the oil market, right? We have possibility, we have the in high inflation is a risk, right? We also have the Russia-Ukraine war posing a risk as to um, oil demand and even supply. And then we also have COVID cases still ravaging in China, which is a very large importer of crude oil, right? So these things would, these are things that the OPEC plus will be looking at, right? There's a possibility that they stay the course with the already planned production increase, that or monthly increase, increase of about 600,000 barrels per day. But then we know that Saudi, there may be a possibility of Saudi trying to prevail on the other parties to increase production output based on the meeting Biden had with the Saudi president. But then there's still this thing of increasing production quota. Yes, you can increase production quota, but then there's also the capacity, right? There's also that part of the capacity when we look at capacity. And then the speculations that or contrary to what we think, Saudi and the UAE don't have that much spare capacity to boost production. Already, all production is already close to about 10 million barrels that were that was pulled during the pandemic. Already close there, and then we also have <clears throat> we also have um, Libya increasing production, and then you also have um, political tensions in different countries causing affecting um, their own supply, like Ecuador. And then we have a case in Nigeria where. We have this quota and we're not even meeting it because of vandalism of the pipelines and all. So these things are, are things that they will be considering, right, and before they they come up with a de decision. But I probably suspect that they may actually continue, stay the course to see how see to watch the market some more and see what to do. But because we know the U.S. trying to get more barrels, you know, into the market so that the price can come down. Uh, another uh, story here, we're getting a reduction in our XX uh, crude account. That was trending uh, yesterday. It, it's not looking good there. Well, it's it's not it's not looking good at all, right? Um, what's excess crude oil? It's just the, the difference between the market. You have the market price of oil and then the um, amount you have bought, you have in your appropriation bill for crude, but they said benchmark price That account should be loaded by now. So you, that difference is what you're being, what is being saved in the excess right. crude account. So when we look at what has happened, we have uh, in the past month this year, we've seen oil prices go over the $100, $100 per barrel, right? And that has been um, an increase that we have not seen in a while. And then, so when we look at how much we have put as a benchmark in our bill, we should be expecting exactly. a lot. Yeah. But then like savings, if you have a savings account, if you don't put anything inside, you're not um, going to have 
excess there. And then if you keep okay. on taking from it, it's going to deplete. Where's we've been taking, I think there was a time they took about a billion dollars for security right. forces to tackle insecurity. But then we look at it, what has been the result of that? Right. So okay. it's it's really uh, There's so much so much funny. to unpack there and uh, hopefully we can get some uh, savings back in there. Thank you so much, uh Maywa Ige, analyst, financial directors company. It was great having you. All right, now let's uh, head on to the crypto market. Let's see what's uh, going on there. We see right now it's just fear. It's no more extreme fear in that market. We're seeing uh, the, uh, the, the fear greed index showing it's 32 points, showing that uh, traders are not as afraid as they were you know, previously. It's just fear this time, but there's still fear, obviously, in the market. Traders are still cautious. Let's look at the market cap there. We see it's uh, $1.06 trillion. That's up about 8.35%. We saw that boost. Uh, immediately, uh, the Fed actually raised uh, rates uh, yesterday by 75 basis points. We saw the crypto market actually uh, react to that. Volume traded, $92.16 billion. That's up about 48.60%. And see the price of Bitcoin. We got a massive uh, jump yesterday. It's uh, $23,201 this morning, uh, up just 0.15% this morning. But yesterday, it jumped about uh, over 7%. Volume traded $35.13 billion, and we see Ethereum there, uh, $1,646. Ethereum had a massive jump uh, with that news yesterday, about 10%. It's uh, trading about 0.27% up this morning. Volume traded $24.94 billion. All right, let's bring in Amari Sashay now, eCash uh, creator. Uh, great to have you, Amari. Good morning. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, so I saw a report about uh, Bitcoin uh, mining difficulty, you know, falling again uh, down about 10% from uh, all-time high. But first of all, I want you to tell us what exactly uh, this Bitcoin mining difficulty is. Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, uh, new Bitcoin are created through a process called mining. This process also secure the blockchain and all existing transaction. Um, to do this mining, you know, I, I say in quote, because they are not literally putting stuff out of the ground, right? They are running computers that do complex computation and uh, the result of this computation is used to secure the network. Uh, the difficulty is literally what it means. It's all difficult it is to mine at a, at a given time. And every two weeks in Bitcoin, the difficulty adjusts. Either it becomes more difficult or less difficult to mine, such as a new block is found every 10 minutes, right? So if new miners enter the market, no more people are mining, so the difficulty gets higher. And if miners leave the market, then there are less miners and they find less block, and therefore the difficulty gets lower, so that one block is found every 10 minutes. So the fact that we see the, the mining difficulty going lower means that there have has been some miner who left the market recently, right? This is this is what it means. And like all in all, it's obviously a bad news for those miners, right? Like it probably means that those miners are going bankrupt, but it's a good news for the market overall, right? We saw last year people over investing into crypto and into Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, when people overinvest into something, then, you know, they kind of need to go bankrupt at some point, at least some of them, for the market to re-equilibrate. So what we're seeing right now is the market, you know, uh, going back to a baseline that is more reasonable than the one we saw last year. Um, what you need to realize is that those miners... Uh, they had to sell the Bitcoin that they mine, right? This is why they are going bankrupt. They are not making enough money mining to cover their cost. Even though, um, even so though uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is trading at this price, even though Bitcoin is trading at this price, they're not making enough profit. Well, because they probably got into the market last year, you know, when Bitcoin was at like 50K or 60K, something like that, right? Uh, so, so they made the cost provision based on that and, and they are not profitable at, at 20K. Okay, right. so what, what happens is that when Bitcoins go up, it becomes widely more profitable to mine. And so more and more and more people are getting into mining, right? Um, such as, you know, such as the cost of mining, you know, equilibrate with the cost of Bitcoin. You know, when Bitcoins go up, it becomes more difficult to mine because more people are going into the market. And as a result, mining Bitcoin becomes more expensive. Right. So there's a cost to actually mining it. And so you have to make 
you know, uh, the profit to actually, you know, keep up with that cost of mining Bitcoin. All right. Yeah, so, obviously. Uh, yeah. You need to pay the electricity bill. You need to pay the maintenance of the facility where you are for equipment, the mining, you know, all of that as, as a cost. And I'm sure I'm sure there are there are miners of Bitcoin in in Europe, and we know that Europe is going through uh, some gas issues. You know, at this mm -hmm. point, that that would actually impact Bitcoin mining. Yeah, at least in Europe, yes, the the miners that are in Europe are going to be impacted by that. This is for sure. They probably already are. I'm sure, but but major miners are on, on what part of the world? The major miners of Bitcoin. Uh, for the most part, miners are in part of the world where there is a surplus of electricity that is produced because they can use that surplus of electricity for, for very cheap. So that would be in some part of China, typically like mountainous part of China, where they have a lot of hydropower. Um, in Iceland, there are a lot of mining because you know they have geothermal electricity that is very cheap. Um, in Canada as well, they have a lot of hydropower, so there is a fair amount of mining there. Generally, like everywhere, there is a surplus of energy that is produced, uh, is a good place for miners to be. All right, very soon I'm going to find out how many miners we actually have here in Nigeria. But, you know, with the global headwinds we're seeing right now, you know, from inflation, emerging economies, you know, having uh, dollar shortages at, at this point, you know, how is uh, Bitcoin and crypto, you know, playing into all of this? So, obviously, the, the thesis that many crypto advocates are operating on is that, well, because crypto doesn't inflate the way fiat currency does, uh, it's probably going to be good for crypto. Um, it's, it's a reasonable assumption, but we need to be careful because there have been no, no event of that kind that ever took place while crypto existed, right? Like the last crisis of the scale of the one we are seeing right now was in 2008. And it was before the invention of Bitcoin. So even though the thesis is that Bitcoin and crypto is good in you know this type of event, we have never verified that in practice. So you know, like people need to be careful. Right. It remains to be seen. You know how much uh, crypto helps. You know, with most of these emerging economies, we've seen the Central African Republic actually make you know Bitcoin a, a legal tender. You know, in that country. So we'll, we'll see how. You know, it all uh, uh, plays out. All right. Thank you so much, Amari Sashe, uh, eCash Rachel. It was great having you. Thank you. All right. Now, let's uh, take a look at the market there. We see uh, top alt by market cap there. We see BNB there, $269. That's uh, down about 0.08%. And we see Cardano at $0.50, cent, uh, down 0.02%. Uh, marginally down, but eCash does a big mover there, up about 10.32%. Uh, XRP, 35 cent, that's down about 0.23%. Let's look at the top five gainers. We see a fat list there with uh, uh, leader Dow there, uh, $2.16, that's up about 43%. Uh, with that, uh, we saw major altcoins actually uh, jumping after the uh, Fed actually raised uh, rates yesterday as, as other uh, markets. And we see Bitcoin gold there, one of the forks of Bitcoin, $27.18. That's up 27%. And SNX there, uh, $3.78, up about 27.05%. And we see Qtum, uh, $4.44, one of the uh, oldies in the crypto market that's up 24.87%. And uh, Uniswap, uh, decentralized exchange, $8.28, up 24%. Uh, 0.41 percent. We see the top five losers list quite lean this morning. Mostly uh, stable coins, showing that traders are uh, getting into the market at this point, trying to make some profit uh, with those uh, altcoins. All right, now let's uh, move on to another market. We have uh, Ini uh, right there uh, with the details. Great to have you, Ini. Good to be here, Ladi. Good morning, Good morning. and uh, welcome to the market segment uh, this morning. Of course, that was one market. There's another one. Uh, let's, looking at the equities, we see that that bearish sentiment continues uh, at the equities. Uh, yesterday, the market was down half a percent. Equities uh, struggling with the 27,000 trillion naira and a volume more for the second day in the green. But I mean, this doesn't really mean uh, good news. This is an indication of a lot of profit taking sell pressure, still pressurizing the market there. Uh, but we see deals is almost 5,000 for yesterday. Value 4.1 billion naira and volume 829. This went up about 500 percent compared to the previous uh, day. Uh, for the sectors, 
only consumer goods was able to raise his head up, uh, up uh, yesterday. But uh, let's uh, quickly go to the uh, fixed income market. Uh, today, there's a ceremony going on there. Uh, we see that uh, the federal government euro bond and the Jara Sukuk listing is holding as we speak. And uh, we're able to get the debt management office, the director general of the debt management office, uh, Ms. Patience Soniha, joining us from there to tell us what's uh, going on. Okay, Alan, she isn't ready, so we hope to get her really soon uh, to give us details of that uh, uh, event going on there, the Federal Government Euro Bond, which is going on here in Lagos. The Director General of Debt Management Office is supposed to join us. But we do have uh, figures from yesterday on listed market, the NAS, NASD OTC market. Uh, it was unchanged, and we still have that one trillion naira mark going on for the market cap. And uh, volume, just two deals yesterday, 5,312, valued at 581 million naira. And the fixed income space, we have the FGM bonds, nine deals yesterday there. And uh, the April 2049, April 30. March 2036 uh, and the July 2034 had a lot of attention from uh, investors. We're still waiting from that fact uh, to stream into the market and, and give it some, some boost. We hope we'll see that. And then with this federal government bond that we're expecting. Then uh, only one deal for the Treasury bills yesterday, just the uh, June 2023 uh, security was uh, active yesterday. Six deals at the CBN bills, August both of them, four and two, uh, valued at 10.2 billion naira. And uh, that's uh, how the market figures look like. But I, I hope we will be able to get the DG of the DMO to give us updates uh, what to expect from that uh, euro bond before the show ends. Uh, we did, she did promise to join on the show, Laddie. So uh, I guess I'll just see. leave it here until we can get her. And uh, hope Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, how much, uh, you know, investors are interested you know, in, in that bond. Yeah, right. especially with what's going on in the United States, you, you yeah. know, with their interest rates yesterday, see where the dollar is. You know, it was big news yesterday that finally, uh, well, I don't want to say finally, like as if it's something we're expecting, that uh, Seven, the, uh, Naira points. is over 700 Naira, not very good one for the Nigerian yeah. economy. I might even get worse if the dollar continues threatening. Yeah, m most emerging e economy uh, currencies are struggling at this point, And they're also having, you know, uh, dollar shortages as we're also, you know, yeah. seeing that we're seeing remember what Zimbabwe the, is doing with Remember Zimbabwe, exactly. Coins. The union asking the government to pay them their salaries in dollars. Quite, quite incredible. Uh, so much, so much uh, uh, going on now with, yeah, uh, with, like, with currencies actually weakening, you, you know, at this point. So, yeah, and, and, and you know, you know, Ladi, when um, uh, uh, the civil service, not even from the private sector, are uh, asking for dollarization, uh, I just wonder what that will do to the economy, to the value of that country's currency. I think their inflation is about $200, 200%. Right. Yeah, and even their interest rate about the same amount, over 100%. So, I mean, it, it doesn't tell well of that. Of that. And I, I think they were talking to IMF also, yeah. you know, about uh, getting help. But all of those will come at very high cost. Exactly. You and know, by, by the time you have uh, uh, dollarization, and, and we're uh, seeing basically the impact of, you know, the war in Ukraine. We just recovered uh, from COVID and COVID is still with us. And now we have the war. And, you know, we're seeing poor countries actually struggle, you know, at this time. You know, they're not able to, you know, get as much sales out there to actually get the dollars in. We're not even meeting our quota. Uh, talking about Nigeria when it comes to our oil, uh, oil. output. Yeah, so, but lad, it's not just the poorer countries or the emerging economies that yeah, are some, struggling. Some are Everybody's struggling. At this time. Germany is struggling. Yeah. The UK is talking about the year of the squeeze and what's that winter one that they have? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the the uh, US always... is also struggling, even though I think Jerome Powell has said there's no recession around. That, uh, yeah, uh, said no recession. No recession. But we'll see the realities of it. We will see. We will see. Thank you so much, uh, Any. All right, after the break, uh, we head on to London to stay with us. This is Business Morning. All right, now let's uh, head on to London. We have Juliana standing by uh, right there. Great to have you, Juliana. Good morning. Seeing uh, all giant Shell has doubled its profits in the last quarter thanks to surging uh, energy prices and is at a time where households are hammered by high prices. 
Good morning, Lady. You're absolutely right. Shell, which is uh, Europe's uh, largest oil and gas firm with over 80,000 employees in 70 countries, has once again reported an extraordinary uh, trading update that has taken um, even investors by surprise. They've more than doubled uh, their profit from the first quarter to the second quarter. So between April and June, uh, they've posted a profit of 11.5 billion dollars. If you compare that to this time last year, um, it was much less. Uh, but of course, uh, I suppose this was to be expected because there is still a war um, currently taking place um, in the European continent and a lot of oil is needed. Um, if you look at uh, the average price of a barrel of Brent crude during that period, it was about $114 per barrel. This time last year, it was about $64 a barrel. And I think Shell um, have tried to use that um, to their defence. Um, they've also tried to compare this trading update to the trading update uh, that they had in 2013, where they said, look, you know, a barrel of Brent crude was also trading um, at this time. So this isn't just um, about war. We've also been doing some exceptional things and we want to thank our staff. So we're not just profiteering. But of course, it has a sparked uh, more concern about uh, some of these big um, oil and gas firms and how they have been benefiting at a time when people are really struggling. Because we know the knock-on effect of these high um, oil and gas prices is people are paying so much more uh, to try and heat their homes um, and put food on the table. That's the issue that's really affecting uh, millions of households up and down the country. Uh, there was a windfall tax, if you can call it that, although the Conservative government didn't call it that. It has its own name. Um, which was uh, which enabled the Conservatives uh, to offer the most vulnerable household £650. But is that enough? Is £650 in two instalments enough when we know that uh, the energy regulator is going to increase bills again um, at the start of autumn? And then in January, we could be paying over £3,000 um, to heat our homes in this uh, country. Uh, so That's a windfall a amount. Uh, for um, investors and the bosses at Shell, but more heartache uh, for the millions who are struggling at the moment yeah well well maybe more of that uh, windfall tax they don't want to call it windfall tax <laughs> uh, at this point but uh, according to a survey britain's exporters have you know seen their overseas trade stagnate over the past year you know despite strong growth in, in domestic demand tell us more about this well, this is the type of story that's always doing the rounds, particularly on The Guardian, which is a left-leaning uh, newspaper in the UK. Uh, they've taken some data from a survey conducted by the British Chamber of Commerce. I believe they surveyed over 2,500 exporters just to see how they've been doing um, in recent months. And a quarter of them are saying, you know, they're still really struggling. They're struggling uh, because of Brexit. They're struggling uh, with uh, global supply chain issues, labour shortages. I think um, the Brexit transition has been very, very difficult uh, for um, uh, producers here in the UK. Um, there was a time when a lot of the customs checks uh, were wavered, but they have now uh, come into actuality. So it is causing a lot more delays and a lot more costs. And uh, for some exporters, the cost just doesn't um, uh, carry with what they are trying to send. So they are asking the government to do more. Um, unfortunately, government is kind of in recess at the moment because we are looking uh, for our new prime minister. And although tax is one of the big headline um, uh, campaign issues, uh, the issue of Brexit and what to do with uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol and what to do um, around border issues is still um, uh, tense. And we don't know uh, what the correct way forward is. But while the Conservatives are kind of mulling around yeah. uh, trying to uh, uh, figure out how they are going to redraft this withdrawal agreement, um, ordinary um, exporters who are the engine of Britain's um, economy is struggling, according right. uh, to this survey. Yeah, the year of the squeeze, uh, squeeze on. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana. Thank you, Lado. All right, now let's uh, head on to uh, FMDQ. There we have uh, patients who need a uh, DG, debt management office, uh, join us right there. We're having uh, that uh, sukuk uh, there on the exchange, uh, the FGN Eurobond, uh, Ijara Sukuk. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, please, can you give us uh, highlights of uh, how the uh, listening is going? Um, once we came to it, I really like three transactions. Uh, Four billion uh, US dollars to move on down to the second one. Another 1.25 billion 
All right, uh, sorry, the, the audio is not uh, so uh, good there. We'll try and get uh, his patient, Soniha, the DG Debt Management Office, try to get her uh, back again at this point. But uh, right now we're seeing that this uh, debt... Uh, this uh, debt uh, 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 listing on the FMDQ, and uh, we see that the Naira right now, the uh, Naira, the, the parallel exchange, not uh, looking so good. So it's the market we don't uh, like to talk about. We're seeing that uh, the Naira depreciate as low as about 710 Naira at uh, this point. So a lot of issues there uh, with currency and uh, all of that. We'll take a track now. On, uh, because that's having you know, a major impact on uh, purchasing power. And uh, obviously, with rising inflation coupled with uh, a depreciating currency, uh, that's uh, a recipe for disaster for most uh, developing countries at this point. And, and now, we also have that issue of uh, uh, the CBN governor being summoned you know, by the Senate at this point. Hopefully, uh, I'm not sure what difference that would make at this point, but... Uh, we're seeing uh, demand for FX, you know, at this point, uh, still rising. And uh, at the end of the day, a uh, country needs to produce more to be able to get most of those uh, FX in. So at the end of the day, we're, we're uh, struggling, you know, with uh, all of that at this point. But uh, we've also uh, seen, let's uh, hear that track again of the Senate there uh, calling for the CBN governor. The Senate is further concerned that, as at yesterday, the exchange rate in the autonomous segment PDC of the foreign exchange market was 670 Naira to the United States dollar. And we are told that this, this afternoon, the figure has gone up to 716 Naira to a dollar. The Senate further notes that the CBN should take new measures to curb forest scarcity and address the sliding rate of Naira exchange. Accordingly, the Senate resolves, one, to call on the Central Bank of Nigeria to urgently intervene to stop the rapid decline in the value of the Naira vis-a-vis -vis the dollar and other international currencies. Two, that the Senate Committee on Banking, Insurance, and other financial institutions should conduct an assessment of the central bank intervention funds and the declining value of the Naira to come up with sustainable solutions. All right, we do apologize. Uh, we couldn't bring uh, the DG Debt Management Office. We had some technical uh, issues there, so we couldn't get all that information uh, we needed from her. But at the end of the day, we still have you know, uh, most of these uh, currency issues still uh, plaguing most emerging uh, economies at this point. All right, we didn't uh, touch much on the uh, our equities uh, market because of time, but now we saw that the market actually declined uh, yesterday. Again, we saw uh, stocks from MTN and GTCO again pulling down the market. It's uh, the seventh, I think the seventh consecutive day of losses we're seeing in that market. Well, fingers crossed, we're watching out for how uh, today plays out the deputies market. Maybe we'll see some uh, bargain hunting at this point because we're seeing most of these stock prices uh, at really uh, juicy uh, prices at this time. All right, uh, that's a wrap on the program. Uh, don't forget to join us at 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.